Hello and welcome back to our Youth Worship Service online. Tonight we're continuing our study in the book of Galatians and we're finishing off chapter 1. So the verses are uh, chapter 1 verses 11 to 24. Now there's quite a lot to get through tonight um, and I don't want to make this a very long video. So I'm going to get stuck straight in. If you want to read those verses before we begin, that would be great. You can pause the video and read them. But as always, I'm going to read the verses just before I study them anyway. So you will be hearing from God's word and then you'll be hearing um, what we have, what we can learn from it. So it's Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 to 24. Two weeks ago, when we started our study on Galatians, we noticed uh, straight away that Paul was defending himself. Some people didn't believe that he truly was an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so we started by clearly setting out that he was an apostle and he was made so by God and not by man, for it was Jesus himself who called him. Then last week, something we looked a little at was the message and the messenger. And if you remember, we said how even if a man is completely qualified, if he looks the part, even if he knows his Bible inside out, it doesn't necessarily mean that his message that he brings is reliable. But if the message is reliable, if it's biblical, then that's great. It's wonderful. And we know we can trust the one who brings us that message. Well, in our passage tonight, we see Paul really giving us four pieces of evidence that his message and that his ministry is reliable. It's the true word of God. He knows that if the messenger can't be trusted, then neither can the message. And he writes these few verses not to vindicate himself, not just to defend himself, but he does it more importantly to vindicate his message, so defend the, the gospel of Jesus, which he preaches so faithfully. It's almost like a, a testimony or a short snippet into his autobiography. He could have gone and preached doctrine here to show what he knows, to try and prove himself, to prove his message, but... Instead, he simply just tells his story. And if you've listened to the first few studies over the last couple of weeks, and you look at verse 11, then you'll see something that seems strange straight away. Paul has been getting stuck into these Galatians for abandoning the true gospel, for listening to false teachers, for getting caught up in people-pleasing. Yet what does he call them here? He calls them brothers. Not everyone reading this letter would have completely turned away from the gospel. And some who had maybe started to just simply needed reminding of the gospel message. There were still true brothers and true sisters among the congregation who needed the message Paul was bringing. And he is reminding those people of the gospel. It's not that he's preaching it for the first time. The way it's written suggests that it is a reminder, something that they have already heard. But as I say, there are four arguments, four pieces of evidence that Paul's message and ministry is reliable and is the true word of God. So what's the first piece of evidence? Look at verses 11 and 12 there. Paul says, The gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel, for I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul's first piece of evidence that his message is true and accurate is that it is straight from God. God revealed everything to him in a special way, by divine revelation. This message, it hasn't come from man. He didn't go anywhere to learn it. He didn't spend years reading books and being taught it. It was revealed to him by God. It was a direct revelation through Jesus Christ, completely separate, completely independent of man. And the fact that Paul's message always puts everything on God and nothing on man proves the message all the more to be accurate, to be true. He wasn't boasting in his ability to learn or his intelligence. He wasn't saying, trust my message. He was saying, trust God's message. He was saying, I know all of this not because I'm great, but because God is great and he has shown it to me so that I may tell you, look at him, don't look at me. Give glory to him, not to me. That's not the kind of message that a man or a woman would ever come up with. 
We love to put ourselves first. We love to make ourselves the smart ones, boast that we know more than the next person. We love to be the masters of our own lives, our own saviors, if it was possible. Paul says, everything I preach to you is directly from God himself and there is no higher authority than that. The gospel Paul preached was received by divine revelation. So that's the first argument. Secondly then, we have verses 13 and 14. Paul says, For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. Now, if you know the story of Paul, you will know that he wasn't always known by the name Paul. Before he was ever known as Paul, he was first known as Saul. And while he was Saul, he had learned everything there was to know about Judaism. He was very strict. They would have known his Old Testament scriptures inside out. He knew more than anyone else's age. He had invested years of his life in learning. He was so passionately for Judaism that he admits to trying to destroy the church of God. He wanted to do away with the followers of Christ because they were a threat to his own belief. He says there he was extremely zealous. In Acts 9 and verse 1 it tells us that Saul was breathing out threats and murder against the the disciples of the Lord. He was literally bringing men and women in chains bound to Jerusalem to be thrown into prison. As far as he was concerned, he wanted them dead. But then, with his conversion, when Christ calls him on the road to Damascus and he's given this new name, he has a complete turnaround. Everything that he once held dear, everything that seemed so important, the thing that he had invested his whole life in, was completely left behind. He no longer cared for the traditions of his fathers, as he called it there. For now, he knew the gospel of Jesus Christ and forsaking all else, fell helpless before him and served him faithfully from then on. How is this evidence that Paul's message is reliable? Well, he left everything behind to follow Jesus. People don't leave everything they ever knew behind for something that's not true. They have to be convinced and certain that it's the truth. Why did he leave it all behind? Because what he knew and what he preached was not a result of his own thinking, but it came directly from God. Only God can instigate such a a dramatic change and turnaround in a person's life. And Paul was great evidence of that. And even that message should be a huge encouragement to Christians, especially those who have been praying and praying maybe for years for a a friend or a family member to come to faith. It's proof that God can save even people that we would consider unsavable. If you've someone that you've been praying for for a long time and you haven't seen any change yet, then don't give up. Keep on praying. And if you are that person, if you're thinking, how could God save me? I'm unsavable. Well, just look at Paul as proof that you're wrong. God can change anyone. And when change comes out of nowhere in a person's life, it is evidence that God has changed them by his grace. And if you call yourself a Christian, ask yourself this. Is your life a strong argument to the power of the gospel? Because the single best argument for Christianity should be Christians. You represent Christ after all. So how strong and convincing is your argument. In verses uh, 17, or sorry, 15 to 17 then, we see Paul's third piece of evidence. Again, look at it with me there. Paul says, But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. How is any of this uh, um, ev- evidence, or uh, sorry, a defence of Paul's ministry and message? 
Well, after he was converted, we see his first few years in ministry are separate from the other apostles. He's an independent almost, yet he still knew the true gospel of Jesus Christ without ever having to learn it from any of the other apostles. Again, it's backing up his first point, that this message is from God. He didn't need to meet the other apostles for instruction or for training. He didn't go near Jerusalem or the other apostles because he recognised that he had been set apart from them. He had been given a different task, to go in a, a different direction and to preach the good news to the Gentiles. And he wasn't avoiding the other uh, apostles out of disrespect but he had a special commission by the risen lord he had been given this unique ministry and there are a few phrases in those couple of verses as well there that are are worth looking at as well Uh, there's the first one he who had set me apart before i was born again paul recognized he was he was set apart even before he was born for this special work of course all of us who are saved have been set apart even before our birth into the word god is completely in control the bible tells us he knows our days that the the hairs on our head are numbered paul realizes the sovereignty of god over his entire life and verse 15 again it says there he who called me by his grace paul is obviously referring to his conversion here of course none of us are actually saved by anything other than the grace of god If we were to receive what we deserved, then we would have no hope, like Paul. If he had have received what he had deserved even a moment before his conversion, he would have been cast into hell. It was only by God's grace that he could have been saved and was saved. God extended his grace even to someone who had persecuted him and persecuted his people. And it says there, God was pleased to reveal his son to me says paul that is the purpose of god's call to reveal his son uh, to us and in us so that we may represent the lord jesus to the world so that christ might be seen in us as these in the next few verses suggest and so that ultimately god will be glorified fourthly and if you look at verses 18 to 20 they say this Then after three years, I went up to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. And what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. So Paul recalls that he did not visit Jerusalem until at least three years after his conversion. And when he finally did visit Jerusalem, he only met with Peter and James, and that shows again his independence from the other gos- or from the other apostles. And while there, while with Peter, he only remained there for fifteen days. So it's not exactly long enough for a training course. Yet the text here implies that there is fellowship and there's equality with the men as apostles. But how did they get on so well? How could they have fellowship with one another after not really knowing each other, or at least not? Uh, spending any time together well the answer is evidence that the gospel is true how can two people that have never met have fellowship with one another and be in unity because they're brothers or sisters in christ that's a a side effect if you like of becoming a christian we become sons and daughters of god when we accept christ as our savior and trust completely in him and with that we become brothers and sisters of people from all over the world who trust in the same saviour, the only saviour. That is such strong evidence that Paul's message is truth and his ministry is a call from God. Paul's own testimony is such a telling sign that not only is the gospel message true, but it works. God changes lives by calling people in his grace and in his mercy. And he uses those people in mighty ways to spread the word about him over all the earth. So we've had our four pieces of evidence. But then our last four verses of chapter 1. Then he went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. And I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They were only hearing it said, He 
who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. Paul had spent so much of his time in Syria and Cilicia. And it was so much time that he spent there that the churches in Judea, who would have known the other apostles, knew nothing of him. Certainly, they had never met him or known him personally. All they knew was that this was a man who used to persecute Christians. He wanted them dead. He was, he was there when Stephen was stoned to death. But now here he is, preaching the same gospel he once tried to destroy. Paul was preaching Christ. And knowing this, even just knowing that, was enough for these Christians to glorify God. They glorified God because of the change in Paul's life. Because the gospel had changed everything. And he was happy to leave everything behind to serve Christ as his king. If you're someone listening to my voice this evening and you're not yet saved, then know this, that whatever is holding you back, it is not enough. It is no excuse. Paul had an entire life dedicated to one thing, to Judaism. Every part of his being was completely devoted to it. Yet when Jesus called him on the road to Damascus, he left it all behind. He had a, a life before Christ, yes, but he had a new one after along with a new name. His life was changed in every way, even though at a time many people probably thought that this was a man who was a lost cause. But that lost cause changed the world by his preaching. And it was all because of the cross, all because of the grace of God to call a sinner who had no interest. No one is out of reach of the grace of God. And may it be in his own will to call you to himself, even tonight. And for those who are Christians, what kind of change has there actually been in your life? Are you living for Christ each and every day? Are you growing? Are you reading your Bible? Are you praying each day? You don't have to preach to the word, but are you doing those things, those simple things? When others look at you, do they glorify God because there has been a change in your life? Each of us, we all have different stories. We all have different lives. Each of us will have come to Jesus in, in different ways and at different times. Yet we have so much in common. We have all been called by a God through no merit of our own. We have all been equally saved by a worthy saviour through the grace of God in heaven. We all have a God to glorify. We all have a saviour to magnify and we all have a gospel to live out or preach every day of our lives. So let's seek to do that. And may others come to know Christ and bring glory to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gospel message, the message of salvation, the good news that Jesus Christ has come into the world to pay the debt that we could not pay ourselves. He came to rid many of sin and replace it with his righteousness so that we, his people, would be made acceptable before our Father in heaven. Father, too, we thank you for Paul, the apostle, for the wonderful transformation you caused to happen in his life in order that you may be glorified. We thank you for calling him to preach to the Gentiles, to set up churches, to write letters that we can still have before us today to study. Father, we thank you for your grace. For it is by your grace and only by your grace that any of us can ever be saved. For we cannot hope to ever be good enough in our own merit. Thank you, Father, for calling, out, calling us out of darkness and into your marvellous light. Father, we ask tonight that we may be a church and a people that brings glory and honour to you. We recognise that as Christians, we should reflect our Lord Jesus Christ. But so often we fail. May we be good witnesses through our words and through our actions. May we live to please and glorify you each moment. Father, we ask too that you will call many more to yourself. We all have many people in our hearts and in our minds regularly who do not yet know you and who show absolutely no signs of ever wanting to know you. 
but give us strength and give us hope. Even that we may continue to pray for those friends or family members so that one day we may see their life transformed by the power of the gospel. Thank you, Father, for, for challenging us this evening. May we take all that we have learned and use it to grow and to mature in our faith. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.